the old neighborhood. If you're driving to Parkland from downtown, your best bet is to take the Dan Ryan Expressway, I-57, which cleaves like a wide river for the bend here. My name is Eric Charles May, the author of Bedrock Faith, the 2021 One Book, One Chicago selection by the Chicago Public Library. Good evening. I'm Chicago Public Library Commissioner Chris Brown. And on behalf of the Chicago Public Library, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight to celebrate 20 years of One Book, One Chicago, bringing the city together through literature, reading, and this important civic program. Tonight, we're going to have a chance to look at that civic impact and hear from those who helped start this program themselves. We also have a very special guest with us today, First Lady Amy Eckelman. Uh, Amy Eshelman, before she uh, filled that role, she herself served Chicago Public Library, an important key leadership role, and has really been forwarding and continuing that work with important programs like My Shy, My Future. Uh, Amy Eshelman, uh, before I introduce you, just want to say that you'll forever be a part of our Chicago Public Library family. And with that, I want to introduce First Lady Amy Eshelman. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I really appreciate um, your leadership of the Chicago Public Library. In particular, I think during these last 18 months, um, which have been so difficult to have you jump in um, and steer the ship um, and bring our, our team together has, has been um, an amazing, uh, amazing job. So thank you so much. Um, I'm thrilled, everybody, to be here today for the 20th anniversary of, of One Book, One Chicago. I had the great, great privilege to serve as Assistant Commissioner of the Chicago Public Library for 18 years. And um, an especially proud moment was the launch and subsequent excitement of One Book, One Chicago. I remember in 2001, talking to my then boss, the incredible Library Commissioner, Mary Dempsey, about a program that we had heard about in Seattle and wanting to borrow the idea and bring it to Chicago. In true Chicago tradition though, we made the program bigger and better until it became the transformative initiative that it is today. Now hundreds of cities across the country have their own one book programming, but no one has sustained the program like Chicago. The last 19 months have been really hard for all of us. This year, it is now more important than ever to have programs that allow us to reconnect and be in community. So I just wanna thank the Chicago Public Library and the Chicago Public Library Foundation for bringing One Book, One Chicago to life over the last two decades. I also wanna give a shout out to my friend and former colleague, Craig Davis, Director of Adult Services, who is retiring in a few weeks. This is Craig's 26th and final One Book, One Chicago selection. So I just wanna thank you, Craig, for your incredible public service. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer Lezak, the coordinator of One Book, One Chicago. 
Good evening. Thank you to First Lady Amy Eshelman for her ongoing support of One Book, One Chicago and of CPL overall. Tonight's program, Measuring One Book, One Chicago's Impact Over 20 Years, is the latest main stage virtual event celebrating the 20th anniversary of this citywide program. Please visit onebookonechicago.org for other upcoming programs, reading recommendations, on-demand video content, and more coming through the end of the year. As the First Lady alluded to, tonight's program is possible and One Book, One Chicago is generously funded by donations to the Chicago Public Library Foundation. Visit cplfoundation.org for information on how you can get involved with their work. During tonight's program, we'll be monitoring the chat for questions from the audience for our Q&A following the conversation, so please feel free to ask one. Now I'm excited to introduce the panel for tonight's event as we discuss the impact of the One Book, One Chicago program over the last two decades. What can we learn about Chicago's readers? How does a citywide reading program create community? We'll talk about these questions and more. Now our panelists. John Shanahan is Associate Dean, Director of Liberal Studies and Professor of English at DePaul University. John earned his BPhil in English and Philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh and his PhD in English at Rutgers University. He joined the faculty of DePaul in 2002. His research interests include 17th and 18th century English literature, the history of science and technology, science fiction, and digital humanities. He is co-leader on DePaul's Reading Chicago Reading Project, which studies the One Book, One Chicago program, with support from Lyris and the National Endowment for the Humanities. He has served as the Director of Undergraduate Studies in English and Director of the Graduate Program in English. He currently directs the Certificate Program in Digital Humanities and is the Associate Dean and Director of Liberal Studies in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and Social Sciences. So thank you, John, for being here. Ms. Barry Dempsey served as the first chair of the Board of Directors at DePaul College Prep from 2014 to 2016. She was elected president of DePaul College Prep and president of the DePaul College Prep Foundation. She remains a member of the Board of Directors. Ms. Dempsey is an attorney and president of the Philip H. Corby Foundation. From 1994 through 2012, she served as the commissioner of the Chicago Public Library, where she was responsible for the construction of 44 neighborhood branch libraries, the introduction of rich book collections and technology system-wide, and the creation of innovative programs such as One Book, One Chicago, and the U-Media Digital Technology Initiatives for Teens. Prior to her appointment as the commissioner of the Chicago Public Library, she practiced law for 12 years in Chicago, and that was preceded by her first professional job as a public librarian in suburban Chicago. Ms. Dempsey is a trustee and former chair of the Board of Directors uh, of the Board of Trustees at DePaul University, a member of the Executive Board of the Big Shoulders Fund, a trustee of Francis Xavier Ward School, a member of the Board of Misericordia, a member of the Board of Directors of the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the founding chair and leader council of Mercy Home for Boys and Girls. She holds a BA from St. Mary's University of Minnesota, a Master of Library Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and a JD from the DePaul University College of Law. She has received five honorary degrees and numerous awards for her work. Thank you, Mary, for being here. Kathleen Rooney is the founding editor of Rose Metal Press, a nonprofit publisher of literary work in hybrid genres, as well as a founding member of Poems While You Wait, a team of poets and their typewriters who compose commissioned poetry on demand. Her most recent books include the national bestseller, Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk, The Listening Room, and Cher Ami and Major Whitsley. A winner of the Ruth Lilly Fellowship from Poetry Magazine, she is the author of nine books of poetry, fiction and nonfiction, including the novel, O Democracy, the novel and poems, Robinson Alone, based on the life and work of Weldon Keyes, the essay collection, For You, For You, I Am Trilling These Songs, and the art modeling memoir, Live Blue Girl. Her first book is Reading with Oprah and her first poetry collection, One Eye Romance, won the 2007 Gatewood Prize from the feminist publisher, Switchback Books. She is the co-author of the poetry collection, That Tiny Insane Voluptuousness, and the chapbook, That Kind of Beauty That Has Nowhere to Go. And with her fellow DePaul professor, Eric Plattner, she is the co-editor of Renee Magritte's Selected Writings. Her reviews and criticisms have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the Poetry Foundation website, the New York Times Book Review, Bitch Magazine, Allure, the Chicago Review of Books, the Chicago Tribune, the Paris Review, the Los Angeles Review of Books, The Nation, and elsewhere. Thanks for being here, Kathleen. And finally, I'll introduce myself. I'm Jennifer Lezak, the coordinator of the One Book, One Chicago program at Chicago Public Library. I've managed the program since 2014, overseeing the expansion to season-long thematic pro program offerings, a presence in every single location of the 81 CPL locations, and a full complement of virtual programming for patrons to watch online. 
And in addition to One Book One Chicago, I curate and produce other cultural and civic programming for adults at CPL, including the Authors at the Library main stage events, the popular Snacks in the Stacks cooking show, and so much more that you've probably seen on this YouTube channel before. So please join me in welcoming our panelists to the CPL virtual stage. Okay, uh, thank you, Jennifer, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, if we could run the first slide. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks. I'm going to be very brief, but I want to give an overview um, of the 20 years and some of the research significance um, of the program. Um, as seen, I guess I could say from academia, you know, um, it is a popular program that's lasted for many years, but there's also some research interest and I want to say a little bit about it before we open it up to the larger panel. Um, so in w w one uh, first thing you can see on the slide uh, is the uh, 32 choices, the 32 seasons that have um, spanned these 20 years. And um, I'd like you to take a look at the variety there. Um, there's different genres, there's fiction and nonfiction. Um, and, you know, the research question of my uh, team is actually pretty simple. The books change, but the library system does not. I mean, you know, give or take little bits, a new branch here, a new branch there. The city um, largely stays the same in the sense of demographics. Again, there are some shifts, but, you know, annually a different book is chosen and theoretically large swaths of the public um, are reading it. So what's the difference and what would the data tell us about it? If you knew which neighborhood branches check out more or less of which books, what can that tell you? So that's the premise um, of reading Chicago reading. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the, the other, uh, I think the, the largest takeaway that I'd like to put in people's minds tonight is also the fact that it started in 2001 and these last two decades are marked by one of the biggest media shifts you know, anyone has lived through, which is the shift from web 1.0 to web 2.0. And what I mean by that is a program that began in the imagination of physical book clubs with people around a table, say, or in their living room with physical books has changed to a largely digital um, affair. So if you look on the left, um, you'll see what the imagination was of the program as it started. There even were so-called book club in bags that you could uh, you know, check out a, a bag of the, of the book to bring to, to a meeting. On the right, you'll see the kind of world we live in now where people are listening to the books, um, people are writing what they think of it on Goodreads, they're linking it to other books, they're putting it in, you know, kind of curated catalogs about what they do. Reading is a totally social activity. Um, the internet has reminded us of this, but it's always been that way. I want to say really quickly to remind us that reading has been social since, you know, forever, um, up through the 19th century. Um, one person might read while others sat around, you know, sewing or doing other work or something, you know, and pass the, the storytelling around. So um, the sociality we see around us, um, you know, is amplified by the internet, but it's not uh, totally new. Um, also on that slide on the right, you'll see the kinds of ways people interact with the book. So um, the, the phrase that Chicago Public Library uses, the book is just the beginning for this program, is absolutely on point. Um, and it's literally true. The book might be, you know, the center of the experience. I hope you read it and, you know, each season many people do, but many people come to the program um, for other reasons or because of other reasons. They might go to a maker lab. Kids might, you know, be um, interested in one of the films that's associated with the book. And if that gets them into the program, that's great too. So what you'll see is, um, and I've just taken a few screenshots to show the kinds of riches over the years that are associated with the social media of this program. People are tweeting about um, as they're reading, sometimes page by page, you know, they're the takeaways that come to them. Uh, Jennifer and others have posted kind of challenges out to people in the you know, community, what do you know, pick a favorite building or pick a favorite musician when the theme is music, those kinds of things. Um, so that the experience becomes something um, truly social. And then finally, um, the last kind of sociological or philosophical point about this is, this is a reading um, experience. And so that means everyone's experience is going to be different. This is not like a news feed 
sending people to read literature or nonfiction all across the city is going to provoke different responses to it. You know what I mean? Um, and so I want us to think about that too. And that's really important um, as part of a civic infrastructure. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'll just very quickly uh, I'll give you an example of the kind of data we have. I should say, first of all, just for anyone watching, we have no individual checkout records. It's not even kept by CPL or any library. We do not have individual checkout things. What we have are aggregate numbers, right? It's like at this branch, this many of this book. So for instance, I'm just showing you um, from the 2015-16 season, Third Coast, if you make a uh, bar graph of the checkouts of the full season, um, there's almost 4,000 checkouts of that book. That is at least 10 times what the predicted uh, amount would be. Um, keep in mind too, this is why digital matters. There are not several hundred copies of some of these books, right? And so part of expanding the reading needs to be in e-forms and audiobooks and playaways and all the other formats that you know make this uh, thing happen. And then the other example that you're seeing on the right, um, again, I won't go into the details, but if in Q&A or if people have questions later, you can email me, um, is you'll see a, a, a stepped, uh, step down there with three little um, uh, uh, parts where it goes back up. This would be in the middle of that chart is the initial launch. And a lot of people check out the book immediately after it's announced, right? But then it falls off, but it doesn't fall off totally consistently. Consistency. So what you're seeing there is I've annotated it where, for instance, this is um, Gold Boy Emerald Girl, Eon Lee herself came to Chicago and I've marked it where it is. And you'll see that there was an uptick of checkouts again. So the interest of this project, I should say for librarians is when can we quantify how effects work and push other books, right? What would be the best way for a book to push another book? And is it social media? Is it having an author come to town? Is it um, you know, an event of a certain kind? And that's partly why we're collecting this data too. Next slide, please. Um, this one, I hope the, uh, on the left, this will play. It's a, um, it's a actually an animated map doesn't look like it is, but okay. What you hopefully would have seen on the left is that map would populate and get darker um, over the months as the book is checking out. So it doesn't look like it's running that way, but that's okay. Um, what would happen is as month by month, you would see um, the checkouts accumulate over a city map. Um, each branch is marked there. Um, if you do that with different books, you can start to see the way different choices of books and by this, I mean, keep in mind, we have nonfiction books about Chicago. We have fiction books about Chicago. We have one set far away. We have historical books. It's like, you know, what checks out in what parts of the city and why? These are interesting research questions and they're part of the civic fabric. Um, over on the right at the top, you'll see, for instance, one sort of mock-up of this is books about Chicago versus books that were not about Chicago as choices. And you can see from the um, graphic there, um, again, I hesitate to make any uh, assumptions right now, but there are ways that one might say that some neighborhoods in the city are more interested or more invested in reading about the city than other parts, right? So there, there are interesting research questions to be done. Finally, at the bottom there is a checkout pattern showing a couple different seasons. So I just want you to see that generally there's a big um, announcement bump and then the book kind of trails off over the season. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I wanted to keep this quick because I wanna hear from others uh, and uh, talk about the program. So if you have other questions, of course, you can please just Google um, Reading Chicago Reading or something or contact me. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. And then actually you can end the slideshow. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna serve as MC at least at the beginning to get uh, questions going and um, uh, my first question is for uh, Commissioner Dempsey, because I'd like to, you know, hear a little bit about the origins um, of the program. Just as a reminder, everyone, you know, the fall of 2001 um, is notable, you know, because of 9-11, which happened just a few days after the announcement of this book. But the late 90s in Chicago were cows on parade, Millennium Park being finished. Um, people thinking about the city as a new kind of, you know, integral unit, 
what civic uh, uh, participation was, um, what space should be like, and what reading was would be like. So um, if you don't mind, you could tell us a bit about how you came up with it and pushed it into reality. Sure, sure. Thank you very much, John. And and I want to thank you and, and uh, Kathleen and everyone at DePaul University. Uh, since the very beginning, DePaul University has been a partner of One Book One Chicago and has enriched the program. So thank you for that. And thank you to um, Chris Brown, the commissioner, for his very gracious um, invitation to participate in this, along with Jennifer. Uh, and as uh, First Lady Amy Eshelman said, Craig Davis, who is off somewhere monitoring this, um, this program works because people like the First Lady, Amy Eshelman, uh, were such great collaborators and understood that the role of the public library um, can, can help build community and build neighborhood. And uh, we had at this time, uh, about 75 of our branch libraries were conducting neighborhood book club, book discussion groups. And when Amy, you know, came to my office and said they're running this incredible program in Seattle, but it's very small. And it was started by a great librarian by the name of Nancy Pearl. And it was designed to get Seattle reading the same book at the same time. And, and we thought, well, we know how to do book clubs. And a reporter for the Tribune, Patrick Reardon, kind of was writing about this program in Seattle or, or knew about it and kind of encouraged us as well. So we went, um, we, we kind of convened our group uh, in the office there at, at the public, at the Harold Washington Library Center and said, what if we tried this? What's the worst that could happen? Let's get the entire city to read it. Let's make it big, let's make it bold. Uh, we loved the idea. And then we had to figure out what book would, would bring everyone together. And again, it was a collaborative effort by a group of librarians in my office, now Chris Brown's office, saying, what about this? No, what about this? Yes, what would be appealing? And we had a couple of criteria. It had to be something that would appeal to everybody from eighth graders on to adults, because we wanted to encourage young readers and high school readers and college and, and adults. Um, we wanted it to be a book that would stretch people's imagination. It had to be well-written. Um, and it had to be something that was really going to, we thought, resonate. As you said, uh, John, you know, the city was kind of on fire with all these neighborhood initiatives and cultural initiatives. And how could we add to that catalog? And um, I don't remember who, and I wish I do, but I think all of a sudden several voices said, To Kill a Mockingbird. Let's pick To Kill a Mockingbird. And we probably did this in July of that year and started putting together all of the resource guides because it, I, was, I was emphatic that we had to put the book in context of its time. It clearly was drawn from the storylines of the Scottsboro Boys and the terrible injustice done to the Scottsboro Boys. So we needed to create a resource guide that would not only set it within that context, but have people in Chicago in the year 2001, understand what it must have been like to be in Alabama in 1930s, um, and and that the whole racial context, but just the uh, the resonance of the story and the beautiful writing. So we created the resource guide, and um, we reached out, believe it or not, to Harper Lee, and um, I don't even remember how we did it, but we by hook or by crook, we kind of found an address for her. We wrote her a letter and asked her if she would come because Mayor Daly was very uh, enamored of this project. Um, just as, you know, if we had come up with this when Mayor Life was mayor, she would have been completely on board with this project. This is such a, a great role for the library. But we, I wrote to Harper Lee and didn't hear anything and didn't think anything of it. We went on with our preparations and um, in the middle of it all, 9-11 happened, which was a horrible tragedy for our nation and for this world. And we thought, do we, do we delay this? Um, do, we, do we not go ahead with it? And we as a group said, no, we have to do it. And I remember Amy saying, we have to do it because this is so important to bring people together, especially now at this horrible, horrible time. So. We launched it, we announced it, and it took off like wildfire. I was fielding phone calls from the New York Times and the BBC and 
And uh, in the middle of it, as I was just reminded by um, Amy Eshelman, um, a school district in Missouri banned the book uh, because they thought it was inappropriate. And, um, and so there's nothing that will help spur a book's interest like banning it. So when asked about it by the press, we said, you know, Missouri has a different kind of context than Chicago. And we are proud to continue on with this book. We love this book. It says something about the people of Chicago that they embraced it in so many um, beautiful ways. And, and we did, there were programs everywhere. There were children and the Chicago Bar Association who put on a mock trial of the trial scene itself. Um, there were people who told me my father who was basically illiterate learned how to read so he could read this book. Um, and then in the midst of it all, my, the phone rang in my office. My secretary picked it up and she came in white as a sheet and she said, Harper Lee is on the telephone. I said, okay, <laughs> great. And I picked up the phone and sure enough, it was Harper Lee. And um, she said, I just want to thank you. I don't make public appearances. I cannot come to Chicago, but I want you to know how much I appreciate what you have done. And these are her exact words for my little book, you have, this is the most important thing that has ever happened to my little book. And I said, well, you know, <laughs> Miss Lee, with respect, I do believe that all the prizes you've won and the notoriety and the sales you've had uh, over the last several decades might be a little bit bigger than what we're doing. But she said, no, no, no. The fact that you have an entire city coming together to read a book and then to talk about it, because reading is such a solitary activity, but then to talk about it together, to live it, and to share that lived experience, that is the most important thing that you could, that, that could happen to my little book. So it, it was amazing. She also wrote me a subsequent follow-up letter where she gave me her home telephone number, and I was terrified <laughs> to use it, <laughs> but I have it somewhere. Uh, that's amazing. I didn't know that before. That's great. I've read a little bit of the early history, but I didn't know she actually re uh, reached out. That's that's um, that's great. Um, and and I should say, since I know the statistics, you know, over eight thousand uh, times that book was checked out just that yes. fall of two thousand one. Eight thousand is a huge number for you know this system. Um, so anyway, it it was very successful. Um, if I if I can uh, go to the next uh, question, let me ask uh, Kathleen. Uh, you you are someone who has written about Oprah's book club. You are also someone you know very much tied into Chicago's writing scene. Um, you know you're a well known novelist and things. I'd like maybe you could say a little bit about the beyond the book you know uh, nature of um, book clubs and the way people participate and wish to participate and make their own work or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that question. I think um, back when I was writing um, the book about Oprah's book club, which um, came out in 2005, so that feels like quite a while now, um, one of the things I, I did was to understand what Oprah was doing to the phenomenon of sort of social reading and, and the beyond the book aspect was to go back and see the history of book clubs. And of course, they go way back. I mean, there were, you know, in the 1600s and 1700s, mostly women did like Bible study groups where they would get together and read and, and discuss um, passages of the Bible. And then by the you know late 1700s, early 1800s, secular book groups had sort of um, started to spring up and they were primarily the domain of um, women, mostly because women at that time, you know, and all the way up through the early 1900s were sort of not permitted to attend universities and often not permitted to attend um, much school of any kind. And so it was a way for them to sort of um, participate, not just in like consuming education, but being part of like a milieu where people were talking about ideas. Um, and so I think um, the thing that kind of excited me was as I started researching it, seeing how Oprah, you know, at the time people were like, this is revolutionary, this is wild, she's putting books on TV. Um, it was actually drawing on this long-standing tradition. And I think too, as someone, I mean, you're a colleague at DePaul and, and I think sometimes in the academy literature gets this um, more distanced reputation of sort of like literature just being like great works that endure on the page. And I think um, Oprah's book club, and then certainly 
initiatives like the one we're here to celebrate um, kind of take it out of that context and and show, I mean, what I always try to say to my students and what I think I learned from Oprah and, and programs like this one is that literature is not just the words on the page, but it's a whole host of practices and communities and ways to connect. And I, I do want to sort of say that, you know, I don't know if people remember, I mean, Oprah started her club in 1996, which is a long time ago now. Um, and at the time, a lot of people were super critical of the way that she treated literature as real stuff. Like even if it's fiction, it's, it's real stuff that happens to real people. And that a valid way to connect with what you're reading is to think, how is this like my life? Or if it's not like my life, what can I learn about other people's lives? And, and she got, you know, I just remember doing the research, getting so offended on Oprah's behalf. And I mean, Oprah is Oprah. She was fine. But you know, I, I felt like I needed to defend her because people were like, ew, she's, she's treating literature as therapy or she's getting, you know, people to talk about their feelings or she's treating it as self-help. And um, I think, I, I just, I don't know, exciting to be here tonight, like 20 years after the, the One Book, One Chicago program launched and sort of see that Oprah's approach of taking literature off the page and into people's lives like that and using it as a way to connect and maybe even, I know it can sound corny, but like heal, um, has actually proven to be like a really valid way of engaging with with community book groups. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, there's ways that, you know, Oprah in some ways and It might be a nice segue to Jennifer telling us a bit about the programming. I'll come back to some of the other parts of it, but um, if you don't mind, if you could tell us a bit about how choices are made, because, you know, as we all know, and you can look at that, you know, the, the 32 choices of the last 20 years, there it's not strictly a bestseller list. It's not strictly classics. There are all kinds of decisions being done. And so wondering why, and again, uh, I'll be brief about this. This is the research question. If you choose books that are different from the demography of certain neighborhoods, will those neighborhoods still read it? Do people, you know, they, is, it, is it just anecdotally true that people read about them, people like themselves and don't want to read about people different from themselves? That's the kinds of things that the data can show when you have checkout numbers and neighborhood branches and things. Jennifer, go ahead. <laughs> well, it's funny. I was actually chuckling at what Mary just mentioned a few minutes ago when she talked about the the original thought of how they were going to choose what the book would be and that it had to be, you know, the criteria was it had to be well written, it had to have wide appeal, because some of those are still in the document I have of what the criteria for the book is, you know, it has to be well written, it has to have wide appeal, um, it has to be, you know, accessible to our audiences in a variety of, um, you know, formats and such like that. But what, what we do is we take suggestions from our staff from patrons, from partners, like our wonderful partners at the call, um, from really anybody. I have a rolling sort of spreadsheet of suggestions for books and themes. And then uh, we you know, start planning sometimes a year in advance or more for each season. And we come with a short list and we have some themes and we look at you know, what themes can we draw from these books that would appeal at this moment in time to you know, the people of Chicago. So for example, this year, uh, you know, we are coming out of a pandemic. We all sort of were apart for 18 months. A lot of people really evaluating what's most important in their lives um, as they were in this pandemic and as they move forward sort of into the next stage of their life. And, you know, what we kind of thought about a lot was connection and community and what makes sort of those things special in our city. And, you know, that always kind of comes back to Chicago being a city of neighborhoods and the importance of neighbors and you know neighborhoods in in Chicago and so um, Eric Eric Charlesman's book Bedrock Faith is really about a very close-knit group of neighbors on this block that have lived there for many years it's a fictional neighborhood called Parkland it's based on Morgan Park um, and when I read that book I thought to myself even though I don't live in Morgan Park and I didn't grow up in Morgan Park I see those characters of those neighbors reflected in people I know in my life and so that's one of the reasons we thought oh this will be a great book because some of those things are sort of universal. You know, everyone has the nosy little old lady on the corner, right? Everyone has the troublemaking teen. And so we see kind of what, you know, what happens in the book could be a universal theme. And so we, we use that as the jumping off point to program around 
uh, this idea of Chicago being a city of neighborhoods and celebrating all of the neighborhoods and that connection that we're kind of coming back to now. Um, so that's just an example from this past season. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this this program, um, it might sound a bit pompous to say, but I think it's true that this program has a chance to shape the attention economy of the city. And it does, you know, once a year, it sort of, you know, picks a theme, now neighborhoods, but music or food um, or science fiction in the future. And for you know, six or eight months at a time, um, a whole set of programming asks citizens and they see posters and versions of it and the book is around or other books that are recommended by librarians are around it. And all of a sudden, um, you know, the civic infrastructure is thinking collectively about a topic that it might not have otherwise. And so that's the importance of this program just as a kind of general um, phenomena. And so um, that's important. Um, Jennifer, I can follow up real quickly on that. Um, so what what kinds of choices do you uh, make to decide between, say, fiction or nonfiction or S Chicago setting or not? Is it really just a matter of haggling with people? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it is. Uh, sometimes it's kind of like what the right pieces fall into place in the right year. Um, you know, sometimes we tie things to anniversaries. So we did the Plan of Chicago when we had the anniversary of Daniel Burgum's Plan of Chicago some years ago. Um, we've had um, science fiction. We did that season, which was sort of tied into the uh, 200th anniversary of Frankenstein, um, which is considered the first science fiction novel. So we've had some things that have tied in that way, thematically uh, just kind of happened at the same time. Um, but one of the things that I think is interesting is people always say to me, uh, there's a large group of people in the city. And I was one of them myself before I worked for the library, before I even thought I would ever work at the library when I was just, you know, a college, right out of college and heard about this book. and. Uh, this book program and my mom actually said hey did you see this article in the tribune we should read this book together so we started reading the one book together just you know as readers in chicago um, and one of the things that people say to me that is tr was true of myself is no matter what the one book is i'll pick it up and read it even if it's not a book that i would normally read i, I never read anything other than history but i'll always read whatever the one book is that year um, and so that, that's very very common that you hear from patrons and so because of that, we like to try and mix it up a little bit. So if we do a couple of years of fiction, we try to do a nonfiction the next year. Um, if we do something that's more of a genre, we try to do something you know more literary fiction the next year and um, kind of mix up the different settings, um, places, whether it's Chicago based, whether it's taking place somewhere else, um, just you know something that can always kind of keep people's interest so that if you have a bookshelf, as I do in my cubicle, of every single book that was there throughout the program. You have a really wide variety. Um, and it's also interesting because I do, I know a lot of people who um, do buy whatever the book is that year and do have that shelf at their own home too. So um, we'd like to just think that people have a, a very rich library in their home if they have every copy of every one book we've picked through the years. Um, right, and I should say, you know, one one missing piece of our data is who buys the book during the season. You know, keep in mind we have checkouts, but there is the spillover effect of people who, with means, will just buy it on their own and you know follow along. It would be great to know that, but um, I do know just because there's a little bit of um, scholarship on the early season with um, To Kill a Mockingbird, it actually went to the top of Barnes and Noble's uh, list in the fall of 2001. So Chicago itself pushed, you know, kind of a nationwide conversation. And as things do nowadays, we take for granted that, you know, one person's tweet from wherever it is could actually push cultural events, you know, far, far away. Um, Chicago's choice of a book um, had national consequences, not just in more people making the program, but at more people talking about the books we choose. Um, so there's a spillover effect that way. Um, it, Mary, if you don't mind, and I actually this could be a question for anyone um, else that wants to um, answer. One of the things that I've always found really fascinating about the program is the kind of anecdotes of people, um, as, as it were, writing back or talking back to the program. Mm -hmm. um, and so if anyone has a great example of this, you know, kind of social phenomenon, um, I had given one right before uh, this program started of a young African-American woman who recorded a spoken word poem writing back to the famous first sentence of Augie March, the 2011, you know, I am Chicago born um, and sh doing it, I am Chicago born, um, an African-American woman, and then, you know, going from there. But if you have other examples of that. Sure. Um, 
you know, I, I think, and one of the things I neglected to say at the beginning is the choice of the name One Book, One Chicago, the program that we kind of adapted from Seattle was had a very long name. And we thought we need something pithy that people are gonna remember. And again, just as sitting around the conference room table, throwing out names of books to think about, we started coming up with different names for the program. And again, through this collaboration of Amy Eshelman and people like Craig Davis and, and, and you know some of our other librarians who've long since retired, all of a sudden the name emerged, One Book, One Chicago. And it speaks to your point about community and how people come together around a book. And it may be a book that they're not normally comfortable reading. They may only read fiction and we pulled them into nonfiction. But I think the, the title has resonated not only in Chicago, but across the nation, I mean, around the world, actually. I mean, what's fascinating for us was the number of cities that all of a sudden decided we want to do this cool too. And they called it one book, one Tacoma, one book, one Palm Beach, one book, one, you know, and, and everybody took the same title, which was a great, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But the number of cities that chose To Kill a Mockingbird for their first book too was pretty astounding to us. Um, we didn't have any template other than we thought we'd try it and let's go and it worked well. But it was really um, quite lovely when people said, we want to follow this program and we want to choose the same first book that you chose. And then after that, of course, so many programs went differently. You know, before we came live, um, the first lady was, was remembering that when we chose Ellie Wassell's book about the Holocaust and being in a concentration camp, we had a book discussion group with a group of students from Orr High School on the west side of Chicago. And they met him, they read his book and they met him. And what was powerful uh, for us was how powerful it was for them because it opened their eyes to the fact that suffering can be universal and cruelty can be universal and that redemption can be universal. And I, we found it um, incredibly powerful that these mostly African-American young men um, said, I thought my life was challenging, but I, I now know how challenging yours was and I see how you've risen above it. I mean, that, that just gave us hope. Um, the spoken word poem that the young woman did as part of the U Media initiative at Chicago Public Library for Augie March, such a powerful first sentence. It's as resonant for me as the first sentence, of course, of Pride and Prejudice, which is also, you know, just, just an iconic phrase. But this young woman did the most amazingly powerful spoken word poem. Um, they, the, the teens did the same thing when we chose a house on Mango Street in their interpretation. And then, as Amy was also reminding us beforehand, when we selected Toni Morrison's A Mercy, which is a very dense and difficult book, the number of young teenagers who read that book, who devoured that book, and who wanted to, who created um, all kinds of fan fiction out of it or poetry out of it, because it resonated with them. I think we took them to a different place. Uh, and so for that, I'm very, I'm very grateful that we did. When we, when we chose Daniel Burnham's Plan of Chicago on its 100th anniversary, we sent kids out into neighborhoods. And, you know, it's a dense nonfiction book, right? But we said, okay, you're a city planner. Come up with something. How would you redesign your neighborhood if you could? If you were Daniel Burnham, what would you do to redesign it? Their projects were amazing. And uh, we just set them in their neighborhoods with cameras and all kinds of, you know, other, other accoutrements to create neighborhood gardens, to, to create um, walking paths, to create just places to make their neighborhood more attractive, more livable. Um, and some of their projects ended up being shown at the White House uh, with President Obama. So, you know, you just, you never can predict where a program like this is going to go. And I think that's the beauty of great writing uh, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, and the beauty of giving people the freedom to read and to take them to a new place. It takes people to a new place. It's why we all love reading. And it, and it, was, it was just a joy to be able to introduce reading to 
reading different kinds of books to so many other people. Yeah, that, that's amazing. That's great. Um, Jennifer, do you want us to go to Q&A or do we have time for another question? Or? We have time for one more question before we go to the audience, yeah. Um, okay, well, let me, I, I'd like to ask Kathleen because she's got her ear to the ground of like, you know, young authors who want to join the scene and, you know, be, be a published novelist or poet or anything like that. And I wonder about their kind of what I, I don't know, I guess I call it book club ability. Do they, do they work in this kind of circuit of like, you know, a socialized production? Do, do they tend to just go off on their own and try to write and just bring it to class or? Yeah, yeah, great question. I mean, we, we talk a lot about this idea of um, literary citizenship and, and not just writing your own stuff and wanting other people to read it, but interacting with other writers. And I think what's been interesting for me is seeing um, that they are interested in reading as a social practice and that um, TikTok or like book talk is, you know, I'm sure everyone here is, is like, what's going on with book talk, um, you know, or booktube, like YouTubers. I've had so many students who've started their own, um, like putting themselves almost in the Oprah position, you know, because that's like the democratizing effect of, of the rise of social media um, that was much less when Oprah started her club and then when this initiative began and just um, kind of in a very cool way, seizing that authority and saying like, I'm so-and-so from DePaul, I'm an English major and here's what I've read and here's what I've thought about it. Or just the other day I had a student, um, I have them present on literary journals just to see what's out there. And she was like, when I do my literary journal, can I also tell everyone to read this book that I saw on TikTok? And I was like, sure. Um, so I think, yeah, they, they seem like they're definitely carrying that flame into the new frontiers of both in-person and online social realms. Yeah, there's, there's so much um, scholarship in the last 10 or 15 years starting to recognize the you know, kind of ambient media literature environment we're in. I'll, I'll plug Mark McGurl's new book from Stanford. Um, this guy's in the Stanford English department and he has a new book coming out about literature in the age of Amazon. Um, and, you know, a major study of the changes that we're in the midst of and how, um, you know, literary history needs to respond to it. Um, Jennifer? I... That's great. I was just checking and then we got a couple of questions from the audience here if we want to answer those. So um, Adam asked, you've said you've tracked borrowing patterns by different library branches. How do online versus paper borrowing compare? And mm -hmm. how do you track the location of online users how does the medium affect usage patterns? These are some great questions, John. I know Absolutely. you and I have talked here's, about these a here's lot. Where, here's where I need my partner from the computer computer science department. <laughs> um, the, yes, the uh, online e-checkouts don't have a branch associated. There's a like a check-in time and a check-out time, so do we, we don't put them on the map. Um, we we include the numbers in checkouts, but you, yeah, you're right. There's there's not a mappability um, to that. Um, to your earlier question, sorry, what was the first part of the? Um, um, how do you online versus paper borrowing uh, compare, and how does the medium affect usage patterns? Oh, for actual numbers, yeah, um, depends on the book. Honestly, uh, you know, for different seasons, I've seen um, some have uh, e checkouts that are the same amount as paper checkouts, print checkouts, and others that are um, far different. I don't know if I can think of one um, offhand at the moment, but um, it really does depend on the season. Um, because as you might guess, depending on the book, um, it, it places itself in the city very differently. Um, I'll give two examples. The, the uh, image that should have been moving on that one slide showing um, Third Coast, almost all the checkouts were in the north of the city. Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson about the Great Migration thing checked out pretty evenly all throughout the city. Um, you can guess that there were different interests from different groups of people, different branches, and just, you know, a wide, more widespread um, uh, interest in, in the book, in uh, Wilkerson's book. Um, that's, again, you know, this is, this is the hard part of trying to hazard the sociological guesses about this, but, you know, there's something to be said that a book about um, post-war neighborhoods or something, you know, has appeal for certain neighborhoods that might have been covered more, and so people read about their own neighborhoods or something, so that's why the Third Coast checked out in certain patterns. Um, it, 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 again, it, it depends on the season, and um, 
I'll say, I guess the, the easy answer is if you go to the website for Reading Chicago Reading, there is a, there's a um, results um, tab and you can see some of the sheets of um, some of the maps we've done and some of the checkout patterns. So um, I can't quote the totals um, off the top of my head, but please go there and that's a start. And then um, if you want, there's a contact page follow up and I can send you um, more detail. Thanks for the question. That's great. And then we have another question uh, for each of the panelists. What book would you pick as a future one book or what was your favorite of the past one book? So mm. anyone want to tackle that one? <laughs> I'll go I'll go first. Um, I, I love this book. Um, I just helped induct Frank London Brown into the Chicago Literary Hall of Fame. Um, and he has this book, Trumbull Park. I don't know if anybody is a fan. Um, it, it came out um, in the 60s and it's his you know first and only novel that came out before his early death he was in his mid-30s when he died and it's amazing it's um like a protest novel and it's based on the real events of Trumbull Park this um CHA um public housing development that got integrated and it was based on his own experiences with his family and he just dramatizes this struggle in a really like he has this character who's an everyman at the center of it who kind of becomes you know the reluctant hero and it's just it's so moving and I think it goes with you know some of the stuff we've been talking about about being interested in stuff that reflects your city or the history of the city or trying to understand why the city is the way it is today and I think and it's funny um it's angry I just I think it's a great book and he's a great writer and I feel like he's due for a critical reappraisal I'm taking notes on this I haven't read that book <laughs> <laughs> Mary, John Mary, I don't know you know, I'm sitting here thinking, oh gosh, which which one of the books on my bedstand should I be uh, recommending? Um, you know, I, I think um, I'm excited to read The Current Choice because I think it's a brilliant choice for right now for the 20th anniversary of his time in Chicago. Um, and I love the fact that it's about Chicago neighborhoods because I think they are the strength of our city as our neighborhoods. But I... I look, I'm going to look back at, at some of my absolute favorites because they introduced me to authors that I didn't know in the time of the butterflies, but Julie Alvarez was so tragic and beautiful and historic. And as I said, Ellie Wiesel, I think I, it resonates with me because he was still alive and he came. And it was one of the moments in my life where I felt like I was in the presence of true grace, uh, just talking with this man and hearing this man and then reading this incredibly painful book. Uh, and then just watching, you know, when, when we did the Burnham plan and, and, and the, the kids just uh, took it and ran with it, that this book about a, you know, a time that was irrelevant to them could inspire them going forward um, was really, really wonderful. I, I will have to admit that I am and always have been a Willa Cather fan. And uh, I think to, to kind of quiet me, uh, because we used to do one book twice a year instead of once a year. So that's why there's more than 21 books. And, uh, and, and one year they just finally said, oh, let's just make her start talking and let's pick a Willa Cather book. And I said, can we pick my Antonia? And everyone said, okay. Because I think it is one of the most beautifully written books I, uh, along with, you know, Death Comes for the Archbishop. But here's the thing that I loved about it. This goes back to your question about anecdotes. So we, my Antonia is about Bohemian immigrants in Nebraska in the 1800s. And school st students from Pilsen read it and said, I get it, it's our story. It's the immigrant story. It's an American story. I completely identified with it. And I thought, okay, it's a winner. That's great. So I, I love, the next book I'm gonna read is the favorite book for me always. And I always love to take other people's suggestions. And I, I just love the way this program has pulled us in so many different directions. And I hope you always continue to do that. I thought the warmth, warmth of other suns was a beautiful choice, an absolutely beautiful choice and very much needed in that moment in society, in this moment in society. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give two really quickly. I won't say much about them because in the interest of time, um, Catherine Lacey's novel, The Answers, um, is a is a recent book that I think just is really um, 
good for capturing the zeitgeist and the gig economy and precarity and you know young people looking for jobs and things but if i'm looking for a hometown hero kind of book and one that's set in chicago it would be uh, richard powers book generosity from i think like 2008 or 2009. Um, it's set in chicago it's full of chicago neighborhoods it's got a kind of interesting science plot that it's richard powers <laughs> after all so um anyway those are the two i would pick and for favorites in the past um a mercy was great i participated in that um in that program and you know it's set in a period that i really um like uh working on and um pride and prejudice of course was a great you know uh, choice back in 2005. that's great well i won't say any future because it could be a future thing that I might say, so I won't spoil anything, but I will say um, some of my favorites in the past. Uh, I really love this year's pick. It's been a favorite book for a while, so I was so pleased that um, Bedrock Faith got to be the one book this year, but um, last year's book, Exit West, was a book that I had read a few years ago, and when I first read it, um, I couldn't stop thinking about it for months, and I said, this has got to be a one book eventually, so I'm glad that that was able to happen as well, and I thought that that book and the way it sort of portrays uh, the universal stories of sort of immigrants and migrants around in this sort of fictional magical realism universe but um, very true i thought resonated a lot and we got to celebrate all of chicago's immigrants throughout that programming season so that was a really fun season for for us and a great moment in chicago well i think we have come to the end of our program Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. We really appreciate it. I want to, again, say thanks to First Lady Amy Eshelman uh, for being here tonight and also for her support through all of these 20 years and beyond. Uh, thanks to CPL Commissioner Chris Brown. Thanks to John Shanahan, Mary Dempsey, and Kathleen Rooney for being on the panel. Uh, tonight's tech, Leland Mosley, thanks so much. And we also want to just say a special thank you from the library to everyone who's been a, been a part of the One Book, One Chicago program through the years. Many uh, library staff throughout the last 20 years, many of which have moved on and retired now, have been a part of hosting book discussions, hosting programs and branches. Everyone has touched this program in some way over the past 20 years. So we just want to say thank you again to all the CPL staff who has been a part of this um, throughout the years. I want to say especially thank you to my own colleagues, Craig Davis and Jeanette Kopacz in adult services, who uh, were some of the originators of putting on this program when the program first started. So thanks to all of you for being here. Do check out onebookonechicago.org for more programming coming through the end of the year. And uh, this program and many others are available on demand on the CPL YouTube channel and the CPL Facebook page. So if you have a friend who missed it who might want to watch, let them know they can watch on demand. Have a great night, everybody.